Hello everyone. For those of you who know what this means, the hammers are back. So, that's a thing. And between that and COVID, it made me think about things that we cannot control, which led me to Cthulhu. So, today we're going to be talking about what the Cthulhu mythos is and <clears throat> in what we will be doing um, further on down the road, we'll be talking about what the Cthulhu mythos is not. Um, maybe even what it was never supposed to be. These are all very existential questions, maybe. So, um, first things first. Um, the Cthulhu Mythos is a um, sort of conical series of gods. See, it's really hard to explain because <clears throat> if we talk about it the way it was intended and what became of it, those are completely different things. So let's start with um, how it was intended. So um, H.P. Lovecraft, and I know I just said a bad word um, for a lot of you out there. So let me start this off by saying... <clears throat> That in these videos, we will not be talking about if H.P. Lovecraft was a racist. We will not be talking about um, his xenophobia. We will not talk about any of that stuff. Because there are so many books. There are so many um, historians and scholars who have talked this thing to death, and even though those people have done those things, people still argue it. <clears throat> so, I would recommend, if you're interested in H.P. Lovecraft, and you're worried about that, um, and you don't mind heavy reading, um, you need to look up S.T. Joshi, and look at his, um, either I Am Providence, like the two-volume hefty biography, or, um, any of his interviews, because I'm sure if he gets interviewed somewhere, they will talk about Lovecraft, and if they talk about Lovecraft, they will talk about, um, Lovecraft being a racist. <clears throat> so you can look into those things. The other thing I would recommend is um, Finn J.D. John um, at Pulp Lit has put out um, three... You can make as much noise as you want. You don't have... You could sit. Look. <laughs> sit down. Everyone, everyone, tell Zoe she could sit down. There she is. There she goes. Did, did did we all see her butt? And she's chewing food. Gosh, this is just awful. Anyway. Hi, Mimi. Oh. You can't sit down, but you could talk to dogs during my videos? Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway. <clears throat> um, he put out at least three audiobooks. Um, there are also paperback and ebook versions of these. Um, I'll put little pictures up so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, he does a great job at not only narrating um, Lovecraft's work, but um, almost year by year talking about what Lovecraft was going through, what he was doing, and then giving little intros on each story. Um, I do think um, there is a fourth 
audiobook they put out that's probably, it would probably end up being like the third edition of um, the Lovecraft stuff. And it's, so if you have a um, audible credit burning a hole in your pocket, it's like 80 some odd hours. And I think it's all of Lovecraft's work. And um, I don't want to get it. But if I did get it, it would be to see if there was any um, new information or stuff like that. I, I'd just be curious to see what's on it. Maybe I'll do that. I don't know. Anyway, um, so what I wanted to do was kind of go through um, the Lovecraft mythos stories and this is going to be really tricky because another thing that um, Lovecraft scholars and people have debated is what is a Lovecraft Cthulhu mythos story? Because um, a lot of people say he has his um, like Poe cycle, his... Um, Lord Dunsany cycle, his Arkham cycle, his Dream cycle, and his Cthulhu cycle. Um, and I think a lot of those overlap. So um, we'll be talking about that. And then another thing that a lot of people do um, scholarly is just making reference to um, things that are mythos related doesn't necessarily count you have to um the stories have to expand the mythos and i don't agree with that i think if there are stories of his that have things in it like um the necronomicon or um yog sethoth or something like that um those should be added to it because that is a part of the mythology. Um, so with that being said, that part's done. Now, how Lovecraft worked in this period was a lot of the stuff he was doing was going to Weird Tales, which was a, uh, a weird fiction magazine, which was basically... Um, everything from horror, really weird sci-fi, um, anything that was um, not normal. Basically anything that wasn't a romance, like anything that would put goose flesh on you. Something like that, okay? <clears throat> and there were was a group of writers that he conversed with a lot through letters. So, like, Robert E. Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, um, Frank Belknap Long, um, Henry Kuttner, um, there, there were a few more, but um, they would write letters back and forth and chat and everything like that. And they all started um, putting things in their work. So H.P. Lovecraft had the Necronomicon, which is like a evil tome. Um, and then Robert E. Howard had his own type of tome like that, and which I, I can never pronounce it. Um, and then Clark Ashton Smith had... Um, I think it's the Book of Ebon, I think is what it's called, um, and things like that. So they all had stuff, and they would dip back and forth in between each other's mythology, just like, and in fact, it, it was almost like a joke, like, um, like tongue-in-cheek being funny, like inside jokes for their buddies, because there was even one story... Um, and I just read it the other day, and I can't remember which one it was now. But, like, instead of, like, referring to Clark Ashton Smith, um, 
he wrote Clark Ash Tone, like three words kind of thing. So, I mean, it, it was more of like a, a fun, jokey kind of thing. And what is kind of annoying a bit, um, before, well, as a Conan fan, before El Sprague de Camp got his hands on Robert E. Howard's Conan stories to, um, edit them and all this other stuff after Robert E. Howard's death, Robert E. Howard had a lot of references to, um, mythos type stuff, um, and El Sprague de Camp kind of wiped those out of the Conan books. So if you have any of those, um, Lance or Ace or paperbacks, there's a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but there's stuff in there, or there's stuff not in there that should be in there. And if you have the, um, big Del Rey, um, versions of his unedited work, um, you'll see more, um, of those references in there. So anyway, it was kind of like a big, just fun thing that, uh, group of nerdy dudes do, you know? Um, then, um, after Lovecraft, well, let me talk a little bit more about Lovecraft before he died. The other thing about the Cthulhu mythos was, um, H.P. Lovecraft would have never called it the Cthulhu mythos. If he was going to put a deity to it, it would be um, Yog sothoth and that would be um, where it would go naturally. But um, because of the popularity of the Call of Cthulhu um, as a story, um, Cthulhu got the name, I guess, um, by Durlith, which we'll talk about in a minute. The other thing is, is that the Cthulhu mythos would have been like, um, it, it was always a background to Lovecraft stuff. It was never the focal point of Lovecraft stories. Um, just the idea of, um, cosmosism or, whatever it's called. Um, the characters in Lovecraft stories were never supposed to understand or even pronounce a lot of the words. Um, like Cthulhu, Lovecraft said in his letters that um, humans were never supposed to be able to even pronounce it, like the way our vocal cords are set up. So these are words that should never be pronounced. These are just things you see on paper kind of thing. But um, because of the idea of humans being utterly meaningless to the universe, um, we were never supposed to really know those things. And when we learn bits of it... Um, it's terrifying to the point of madness. Um, in fact, let me pull it up real quick. The opening line to Call of Cthulhu, um, the most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. Like, it would be, I always look at it like ants on the sidewalk. Me as me, I could walk around. Um, I could even see the ants going back and forth. I could walk over them. I could walk through them. I could step on them. I could probably go weeks without even noticing they're outside doing anything. And then one day, <clears throat> I could pour a bunch of poison down an anthill if I wanted to. Or I could kick an anthill. Or driving my car up, I could run over the anthill. 
um, it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day life the things I do to the ants could totally affect their everyday life. Even if I let Fred and Mina out, Fred could run right through a uh, ant trail and cause total chaos to the ants. Fred won't notice it. Um, that's how humans are <clears throat> to, um, Cthulhu and the gods and all this other stuff. And, um, it always cracks me up because it's like if ants were writing stories about them noticing us for the first time and the things that we do. And then even funnier, um, the further you get into it and then when you get into um, – the later Durlith cycles and all this other stuff, it would be like um, me asking an ant to help um, bring me into the world. Like, um, like, hey, ant, um, I'm from a different planet, and um, me and my friends want to come and invade Earth, but we need an ant emissary to, like, help transition. It's just, like, preposterous. Or, like, if I were to pick an ant up from outside and bring it in here and go, all right, ant, this is a microwave. It's kind of busted, but I need you to fix it. So fiddle with it. Do some stuff. How would the ant describe it? Oh, there's all sorts of like metal things and um, these things that I think are called wires and da, 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 da. like the ant doesn't have to know what everything is um, to know that it works. And in fact, I could even hit 60 seconds on it and shut the door with the ant inside the microwave and hit start. And the ant doesn't have to know how microwaves work, but when that ant pops, It'll know it worked. Does any of this make sense to you? Like, we are nothing to the gods, to the other gods, the great old ones. Like, we are completely insignificant. Um, and that is kind of how Lovecraft intended it. And even in his earliest work that talks about anything remotely close to that would probably be Dagon, which I'll, is probably going to be the next video. And he's like, yeah, and this giant green-scaled creature came out of the murk and grabbed onto the obelisk. And, um, and then it's like, I think that's when I went mad. Or I went mad then. I think I went mad then. Just like... Like, we are not supposed to understand any of this. Now, after Lovecraft died, August Derleth... Oh, sorry, computer. August Derleth um, started Arkham House, um, which, again, he got from H.P. Lovecraft, to put H.P. Lovecraft's work in book form because um, for the most part there was never during his lifetime I don't think there was an entire book of his published I know there was some stories published in collection books like one or two but an actual book of his work I don't think ever was um, published during his lifetime but um, August Derleth um, obviously wanting to make money and whatever on this. And it's the same argument like I have about El Sprague de Camp. Like, if El Sprague de Camp never did what he did to Robert E. Howard's work, as much as I hate what he did, would we know who Conan is right now? I don't know. I don't know if we would. If August Derleth didn't do what he did to Lovecraft's work, would anyone know who Lovecraft is? And I don't know. He might have been one of those lost in the pulps. Um, 
so you have all these questions that you can't answer. But anyway, the other thing that August Derleth did was he wanted to expand um, the Cthulhu mythos. And then he actually coined the term Cthulhu mythos. And in wanting to expand it, he himself was a Catholic. So he wanted to do this whole good versus evil, that there were good gods and bad gods and all this stuff. And Lovecraft was a complete atheist and believed that humanity was just a speck on the wheel of whatever. Um, so taking different gods and putting them on different levels like these gods are this powerful and these gods are this powerful these ones are really good and these ones aren't and we're going to take these gods from other works like Haster and um we're going to put them in here and we're going to take this and and just started building this whole big thing and then instead of it being a thing where Lovecraft's buddies were just able to use some of the stuff Lovecraft talked about. Durlith was saying things like, oh, he wanted everyone to be able to write in this universe because it's such a um, big and um, wonderful world or whatever. So <clears throat> a ton of people started writing um, Cthulhu mythos stories and tales and books and um, more and more and more into the 70s and 80s. And then he also decided that since so many, um, there were so many tales of water gods and all this other stuff that, um, and gods being buried in the earth, like miles and miles down for millions of years that there needed to be elemental um, rankings or um, whatever. So there were water gods and earth gods and fire gods and air gods, but then there was, what about the gods that are still in space? And, oh, so we got to take care of those. It was it just turned into this, like, huge, ridiculous thing. Um, now, is that bad? I don't know, because if it didn't happen like that would I ever have known about it like would there be like role-playing games and video games based on Cthulhu Mythos stuff if these things never happened I don't know probably not um would Lovecraft Country a show that I still haven't watched so let me know down below what you think of it um would that be something that people would want to watch like would that even have ever been made like you can't answer any of these questions they're all what ifs um so that was a really long story to get to the point of what i want to do is start taking lovecraft's own stories that deal with elements of the cthulhu mythos and just do little videos on them so this is probably the longest video in this whole series, but it's just, it's such a huge world that happened out of a guy who never really thought anyone would ever really know who he was. So it's, you can't discount the effect that Lovecraft has had on horror literature, horror films, um, pop culture in general. So, um, credit where credit's due. And the funny thing is that credit would probably have to go to August Derleth because, um, none of this happened during Lovecraft's lifetime. So, um, but yeah, so let me know down below what you think, um, of the mythos. If you've read, um, a lot of the Derleth stuff or Lynn Carter's stuff, or, um, even a lot of the anthologies that have come out in the last 40 years with everyone from, Stephen King to your neighbor Bill and your Aunt Nancy. Um, let me know what you think of that stuff. And if you like the 
huge expanse of um, the Cthulhu mythos, or if you think it should just have st stayed with one small group, um, what you think of putting ants in microwaves, things like that. Let me know what you think. So until next time, I will see you later.